Good morning. Dr. Pratt, Dr. C. Pratt, please answer the white phone in the foyer. Nobody can hear me out there. Good morning and welcome to worship. Colder this week. Just a public service announcement here. Might get some snow on Tuesday. Be aware. There are a few announcements to, I'd like to make this morning. Uh, Wednesday night, the Bible study is at 6 30. It's on the book of Daniel. Uh, child care is provided. I missed that last week. So not children, child care will be provided. Uh, there is a walk to Emmaus scheduled for this spring. don't know what the walk to Emmaus is, it's an event that the Methodist Church puts together, and it's a personal experience with Jesus that entire weekend. I would encourage you to consider going to that. There are a few of us that have. Uh, it has meant a, a lot to us. April, the walk to Emmaus is at Cross Point again. Uh, April 13th through the 16th is for the men, and the 20th through the 23rd is for the women. If you are interested, contact Wendy or Sandra Pratt at church. Because she's also listed as a spokesperson. And there are other things on the back of the bulletin, uh, activities in the church, people we want to keep in our prayers. Uh, please check that. Welcome to worship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you and fill you this morning. Let us stand together, and we are going to sing a new song. Choir, please join in, because I know you've got the sheet music, because I saw Lex passing it out. Those of you who uh, are not familiar with this, want to listen first and then join in. Come along at the beginning. We're going to do this twice. It's called... From the rising of the sun. From the rising of the sun. To the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Praise ye the Lord, praise him all ye servants of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised.
please join me in the call to worship. It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High. We proclaim your love in the morning. We proclaim your faithfulness at night. You make us glad by your deeds, O Lord, and we sing for joy at the work of your hand. Amen. Let's sing together. Shout to the Lord. to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and stream, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord on the earth, let us sing. Majesty, majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Power to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound. Stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Let us join with Christians throughout the ages as we affirm what we believe with the affirmation of faith, number 883 in your hymnal. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. 
You may be seated. We come to our time of prayer, and um, I'd like to draw your attention to the prayer requests on the back of your bulletin. We want to remember each of these as they're in need of our prayers. I have a joy this week. My uh, niece, Lauren Scott, who we've been praying for, delivered three healthy girls on the 19th. Charlie, Molly, and Sophie, and they all weighed over five pounds, which I thought was pretty amazing. So they're doing well. Thank you for your prayers. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious and glorious Lord, we come to your house today, and we're thankful for all you've done for us this week. We thank you for the joys you give us, we thank you for being with us in times of trial and in times of sorrow. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for our sins, for we know that they are many. And we thank you for promising that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, when we confess our sins, that you heal us and forgive us and restore us. We pray for those today, Lord, who are ill and have diseases they're dealing with. We pray that you would be with them and pour your healing life into their bodies. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and that you would surround them with your presence and give them comfort and strength to carry on. Lord, we pray for um, first responders, police officers, firefighters, teachers and doctors and, and everyone who makes sacrifices for the greater good so that we can be healthier and safer people. And we pray that you would protect them from those who would do them harm, that you would grant them wisdom when they have to make split-second decisions. Oh, God, we just um, commit them to your care. We pray for military at home and around the world. The same thing for them, Lord. Keep them safe. We pray for areas around the world where there is military conflict, There are too many to name. We just ask that you would be with those who are suffering, that you would move in the hearts of the aggressors, that they would lay down their arms and seek peace, because only you can do that. We also lift up Christians around the world today who are not able to gather and praise your name in public. We ask that you would bless them and give them a bold witness so that even their persecutors would turn to you and be healed. Lord, we pray for this church and for our community. We ask that you would help us to continue to be your hands and your feet and your heart in this city and beyond. We pray for the United Methodist Church. And we ask God that you would help us all to clear our minds and listen to a word from you. We ask that you would show us where you want us to be in the future. Help us to be faithful to you and to your call, whatever that might be. Oh, Lord, we now come together and give you honor and thanks and glory and praise as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to our time where we return our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And um, as hopefully you know, this month we are supporting the ministry of Circle of Care as our special offering. Circle of Care deals with foster children in Oklahoma and prepares families to accept foster children. So if you would like, or if God has moved in your heart to support this ministry, just put Circle of Care on your check or on your offering envelope. Um, And please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you've given us everything we have. Thank you for the opportunity to return a small portion of that to you to grow your kingdom in this world. We ask that you would bless it to that end. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Please stand for the doxology. be seated. And if the kids will come forward for children's time. y'all today? Well, today we're going to talk about salt and light. Do you know what salt and light are? It's just salt, like table salt and light, right? But we're going to hone in on the light. So what do I have here? It's a light, flashlight. Don't look at it, it's bright. All right, so the flashlight is like Jesus, okay? Jesus is the light And he shines on all of us, just like that. Isn't that pretty cool? But you know what we're like when we believe in Jesus? We are like a mirror. Can you see yourself? See? And you know what happens when you let Jesus' light shine on you and you forget to practice? Let's see if I can make that shine on something where you can see it. If you aim it just right, obviously I did not practice because I thought for sure, I was afraid I would blind you guys out there. Anyway, when you shine the light and you turn it just right, it's going to shine on other things, right? Maybe. Apparently these um, car mirror things are anti, anti-reflective or something. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway... So, but the light, when it shines on the mirror, it generally goes to shine on somebody else. So Jesus is the light, but we're the mirror. And when we let his light shine through us, it gets on other people. Let me see if I can make that shine on you. I can't even make that shine on you. I'm going to take these back. These are defective mirrors. (laughs) All right. So what I want you to remember is that... We need to let Jesus' light shine on us so he, other people can see it. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, pray with me, okay? Dear God, <laughs> thank you for Jesus, who is our light. Help us be like mirrors to show him to the world. We love you, God. Amen. I guess I bought you all a mirror, so unfortunately it's not going to do like I want it to do, but remember that you're supposed to be a mirror for Jesus, okay? Here you go, girls. Y'all remember too. All right. Thank you. And also, remember when you're going to do something, you need to practice. (laughs) Okay, you can go sit with your folks now. Oh, no, I did not. I was afraid you might shine somebody's eye out. You're the, you can let Jesus shine on you. How's that? <laughs> Will you stand for the scripture? Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 5, 11, 16. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. And for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It can no longer it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill without being hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and give it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. May God add a blessing to the hearing and understanding of this holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Y'all, how are y'all doing today? Good. Well, we're going to start with a quick check-in. Are you reading the New Testament for yourself? I'm not going to make you raise your hands this morning, but you know in your heart, right? Have you learned anything new about Jesus' teachings? I've heard that some people have seen things that they've read several times but leapt out to them this time. And I've already been reminded of many things as I'm reading and journaling. And are you keeping your gratitude journal and expressing thanks to people? Did anybody else notice the small flaw in your gratitude journal? There's not enough days. I was trying to make big lines and I didn't count them. So you can just go ahead and just, doesn't have to match the month or anything. Just put your dates and stuff on there and I can get you some extra pages. But I love this practice because it's keeping me focused on the wonderful kindnesses of others and all the things that I receive from the Lord. I hope you're finding this helpful as well. Please join me in prayer. Lord, open our ears that we may hear, open our heart, eyes that we may see, and open our hearts that we may understand the message you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're continuing to take a deeper look into the Sermon on the Mount this morning and what that means for us and for our lives. Let's start by looking at what it means to be the salt of the earth. We're going to circle back to the persecution part. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt has several functions in the world. It's a flavor enhancer, a healing agent, and a preservative. Salt is essential for life. It's harmful if your sodium level is too low and also if it's too high. The absence of salt makes many foods inedible. Can I get a witness on that? Amen. (laughs) Thank God for salt substitutes like Mrs. Dash. You know, a pinch of salt makes everything you eat better. And it's a healing agent. Before the advent of medications, salt was used to clean wounds and to help them heal. Was it painful? You bet it was. However, it kept infection and gangrene away. When I was a kid with a sore throat... I gargled with hot, salty water, and you know what? It helped. I think I need to remember that the next time I have a sore throat. Even today, many people use a saline nasal rinse to keep their sinuses open, and it's one of the most helpful things I've tried for that. Salt has been used as a preservative for thousands of years, especially with meat. And in times past, salt was very expensive to obtain. People who didn't live near an area where salt was plentiful would pay a premium price to get it. You know, many religions revered salt and used it in their rituals. In some rituals, salt was thrown on the fire to produce sparks and crackling noises. Now, I was unaware that salt would cause that effect, and so I'm thinking I need to remember that too. Perhaps you've already started making some connections as to why Jesus calls us to be the salt of the earth. Wherever scriptural Christians go, they make a place better. 
Now, a scriptural Christian was a term used by John Wesley to describe a person who was actually practicing the discipleship path of a follower of Christ. In other words, it's an authentic Christian who's admitted their brokenness due to sin, who has the love of Jesus in their hearts, and shares that love with the world. Scriptural Christians have made the, better, the world a better place overall. When others abandoned the sick and dying, Christians cared for them. Christians built hospitals and schools throughout the world. John Wesley started Sunday school to teach people how to read so they could read the Bible and rise out of poverty. Scriptural Christians are healing agents in the world today. Most people here in Lindsay know that they can come to the church for help when they're hungry or in need of care. Recently, a couple of churches in Enid banded together to wipe out the medical debt from the local hospital. Millions of dollars in debt was canceled and covered by these faithful Christians. Mercy ships sailed to Africa to perform life-saving and life-changing medical procedures for people who would never receive help otherwise. In the past, scriptural Christians successfully fought to abolish slavery in Britain and the United States. Christians preserve goodness in the world. If there were no Christians, I believe our world would descend into anarchy until some strong military conqueror come along. There seems to be a direct correlation to the decline of our society in many areas and the decline of scriptural Christians and their influence. So we are not to withdraw from the evils of the world. We are to engage with society so we can spread the love of Christ and help grow the kingdom by sharing the gospel. Just showing up and living an authentic Christian life makes a huge difference in the world around us. So what did Jesus mean about losing our saltiness? Well, I think he meant that when we begin to think and act more like the unrepentant people in the world than scriptural Christians, we have lost our saltiness. I've heard that Christians are just as likely to get divorced as non-religious people, and all too often we see people who profess to be Christians get arrested for embezzlement and other crimes. It's especially disheartening when you see the news of a Christian leader who's engaged in some sort of financial or sexual scandal. When Christians are no different than the world, the reputation of the entire church suffers. It truly makes people question the value of faith, and it sullies the name of Christ. Then Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Have you ever been in a place so dark that you couldn't even see the hand in front of your face? Well, at Marvel Cave in Silver Dollar City, I've been there once, and you can go down into the belly of the earth on a nice little train car. You get out and walk around, and you look at all the wonders of the cave. Then when everyone is in a fairly flat place, they gather you all together, and they turn off the lights. It is truly so dark that you cannot see the hand in front of your face. If you didn't know you were standing in a safe, flat place, it would be very frightening. And it's interesting that if you were to light just a match, it would chase the darkness away and provide enough light to see your way out. Light is essential to life. Sunlight helps make plant grows. It provides vitamins that we need to survive, and it illuminates the world so we can see its beauty. When I was in Israel, it was pretty dark at night. We were staying at the Sea of Galilee, and it's surrounded by hills. Our guide pointed out a city named Sephoris, which is a city on the hill right next to Nazareth. And an interesting fact is during the time of Jesus, Sephoris was the larger city and Nazareth was much smaller. Today, Nazareth is the larger city and Sephoris is just a small village. Anyway, 
It's about 30 miles away from where we were staying, and the lights of the city were very visible to us. The light of a city on a hill is a beacon to those who are wandering around in the dark. And as a lighthouse steers the ship away from the shore, and a light bulb lights up the room. It reminds me of my favorite lighthouse story about, uh, well, it's about a ship, actually, so I've already given away the punchline. <laughs> but anyway, the ship got a call, and it said, you need to change your course 30 degrees to the north. And the ship says, I am a ship of the, of the uh, Majesty's fleet, and I will not change my course. And the message comes back and says, you need to change your course, or there's going to be trouble. And the ship's captain said, I am still a ship's captain, and if there's trouble, I'm going to blow you up. Then the uh, response comes back, well, I'm a lighthouse, and if you don't turn, you're going to hit the shore. <laughs> anyway, I would ask you if you knew how many Methodists it takes to change a light bulb, but that's an old corny joke, and it includes forming a committee. <laughs> light doesn't exist for its own glory. It exists to brighten the world. Jesus is saying to us we have a responsibility to reflect his light in the world. And that's because the world is in a desperate need of light, whether they realize it or not. John Wesley used this part of the Sermon on the Mount to really push home the truth that Christianity is a social religion, meaning that we are to practice our faith together in community. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. He said Christianity is essentially a social religion, to turn it into a solitary religion is indeed to destroy it. And we're not permitted to limit our interactions to just other Christians. How can we share the gospel of Christ if we never interact with people who don't know or believe? How can we change the world? Wesley said that as long as true religion lives in our hearts, it's impossible to conceal it. Our holiness makes us as conspicuous as the sun in the midst of heaven. You know, I've got to confess, I need to consider if my faith is that conspicuous. When I was a kid, my mom used to tell me that I was so bright, she had to put a tub over my head so the sun would come up in the morning. But I'm pretty sure that's not what John Wesley was speaking of. So Jesus calls us to engage fully with the world. And the great news is that we don't have to work to be salt and light. If we simply allow the power of the Holy Spirit to shine through us, we will naturally be salt and light in the world. That brings us back to the final beatitude. Blessed are you when people insult you, and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we are actually following Jesus' commands to be salt and light in the world, persecution is sure to come. Now, there was a time in the United States when that wasn't true. When I was young, it seemed like most people were Christians of some sort of denomination, and the biggest persecution was making fun of the other denominations. But that was a different time. Today, if you're trying to live as a scriptural Christian, you're likely to get some grief about it. The last few Supreme Court justices were grilled and derided for their faith in the uh, hearings and in the news. And the accusation was made that they could not fairly consider cases because of their faith. While space is made for all kinds of activity groups on college campuses, increasingly Christian groups are being denied access, such as at Michigan State University. The InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Group was kicked off the campus there after 75 years of recognition by the school. This happened because of their requirement that the leaders of this Christian group had to be Christians. The university called that discriminatory and a violation of university policy. In 2015, Coach Joe Kennedy was suspended from his job and then fired after praying at the 50-yard line for less than a minute after the football game, something he'd been doing since he was hired in 2008. Some of his players joined him in prayer, some didn't, and often players from the other team came out and joined in. It was strictly voluntary. 
no one complained about his practice. In fact, a coach from another school district contacted the principal to compliment him on this practice. And that's when the trouble began. First, he was suspended and later fired. Litigation was filed, and just recently, the Supreme Court affirmed his right to pray. This brave man, a Marine, spent years fighting for, to protect a right for us that is granted in the Bill of Rights. In December, a young woman in the United Kingdom was arrested for praying silently outside an abortion clinic. She was not protesting. She was not carrying any signs. She was not talking to people. She was simply standing silently with her head bowed in prayer, and she was arrested for a possible violation of the public spaces protection order. For me, the worst persecution I've suffered is my coworkers at my former employer didn't invite me to go out with them for drinks after work because I had stopped partying. And even though I really didn't want to participate, it was kind of a bit of a sting from being excluded from the group. More persecution is coming, and you can see it on the horizon. Have you heard about the new policy at Radio City Music Hall in New York City? Well, they're using facial recognition and artificial intelligence to identify people that they will not allow into their venue. Recently, a mom was taking her daughter and a few other Girl Scouts to see the Rockettes at Christmas. Before she got into the theater, the security approached her and called her by name, even though she hadn't given it to them. They asked her if she worked for a certain law firm, and she confirmed that she did. They informed her that she was not allowed to be in their venue because the firm she worked for was involved in litigation with the owner. She was escorted out of the building, even though she has no involvement or connection with the litigation whatsoever. She had to wait outside while the girls were allowed to watch the show. And she's not the first person to be ejected from the venue. It's only a matter of time before people with beliefs and values contrary to many venues will be escorted out as well. John Wesley said that all who live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution for the sake of righteousness and that the scandal of the cross has not yet ceased. Were you aware that more Christians were killed in the 20th century because of their faith than in the, all of the centuries before combined? And persecution of Christians is still very active in the world, and according to Scripture, it's going to get worse. While no one likes to be persecuted, either by being ostracized or physically attacked, Jesus assures us that we'll be blessed and rewarded when we're persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Even so, we're to love our enemies and pray for our persecutors. You know, in the first century, the cruel and merciless persecution of Christians for simply refusing to say, Caesar is Lord, led to the conversion of untold numbers of people. They were crucified, turned into human torches, for Caesar Nero's garden and sewn inside animal hides and thrown to the lions at the Colosseum for the entertainment of the crowds. You know, I thought that uh, we wouldn't see those kind of persecutions again until the rise of the Islamic State where people's heads were being sawed off for being Christians. The way that these early Christians lived and died somehow inspired others to be Christians also. And that's actually more excellent evidence that the gospel and the resurrection are true. All of the disciples who were eyewitnesses to the events of the resurrection, except for John, were executed because of Jesus. They, more than any others, knew for sure whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. All they had to do to escape execution was to admit that it was all an elaborate hoax. Not a single one did. Chuck Colson, who was the chief henchman of Richard Nixon and who became a Christian while he was in prison, said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that 
if it wasn't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me the 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. I'm going to close today with the wisdom of Wesley. He said, let your lowliness of heart, your gentleness and meekness of wisdom, your serious and weighty concern for the things of eternity and sorrow for the sins and miseries of people, your earnest desire of the universal holiness and full happiness of God, your tender goodwill to all humankind, and fervent love to your supreme benefactor shine before all people. Let your faith be so visible that all who see your good works may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let this be your one goal or purpose in all things. Will you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, creator of the universe, you entrusted to us the truth, and you show us how to be salt of the earth and light to the world. Your light shines through us into the darkness of the fallen world, and through us, you draw others to yourself. Help us to boldly provide salt with love, even though it might sting, and to provide light to those who are in darkness, even though they don't want to see. Be with us when persecution comes, so that our witness may touch the hearts of others, so that they will turn away from their sins and turn to you for true healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Will you please stand and join us in our hymn of response? It's an oldie but a goodie, I Saw the Light. any Hank, Hank fans here? Hank Sr.? He's not that far gone, I hope. <laughs> All right. Hear this word of benediction and blessing. You've been called to be salt to the earth and light to the world. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is let Jesus shine through you. And you can do that. The love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give a little gusto to the next one, okay? I know you know it. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, let it shine. Put it under a bushel, no one, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
any worse.